welcome everybody. I'm very happy that you all are here. Uh, my name is Leslie Wade and I am a volunteer director of the North American Fruit Explorers. And uh, we're super excited here uh, to be joined by some amazing speakers for preserving our heirloom apple heritage. So before I introduce today's panel, I would like to share a few housekeeping items and a little about NAFEX as we allow a few more people to join. First, this is a webinar. So unlike Zoom meetings, participants' audio and video features are automatically disabled. But we encourage you to ask questions. If you see below you at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button. Sometimes in meetings, we use the chat feature. In this webinar, we'll be using the Q&A button. So please put questions in there and you can do it early and often. Um, and also you, can, you should have the ability to answer questions. If you know the answer to something that uh, somebody puts in, feel free, um, although we still may want to save those, of course, for our esteemed panelists today. Um, third, if you're newer to Zoom, you can adjust your screen view and some of your Zoom settings on your device. You have a lot of power of how this appears on your screen. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to members and conference participants at nafex.org. So just a few words about NAFEX. Founded in 1967, the North American Fruit Explorers is a network of individuals throughout the United States and Canada devoted to the discovery, cultivation, and appreciation of superior varieties of fruits and nuts. Although the ranks of our membership include professional pomologists, nursery owners, commercial orchardists, NAFEX members are all amateurs in the fruits in the truest sense of the word, and we're all motivated by our love of fine fruit. NAFEX members share ideas, information, experiences in fruit propagating material via our website, our social media channels, our fruit specific interest group meetings, and annual conferences like this one, whether they're in person, online, or both. As a paid NAFEX member, you get four editions of the Pomona Journal each year, as well as the ability to search 50 years of Pomona's in our digital library. They've been scanned and you can search them for content, which is just an amazing resource. The organization exists because of fruit growing members like you. And we encourage you to continue your membership and to become actively involved as an interest group member, committee member, or board member. So please visit our website to learn more at nafex.org. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel members. Today we're joined by Tom Brown, apple hunter and owner of applesearch.org, Joni Cooper of the Temperate Orchard Conservancy, and Harry Burton of Apple Luscious Organic Orchard and the famed Salt Spring Island Apple Festival. So without further delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Brown. And Tom, I'm gonna invite you to share your screen. All right. So if you hit the share screen button at the bottom, that's fantastic. And then we'll pull up PowerPoint. There you go. Fantastic. Take it away. All right. Uh, thank you for allowing me this opportunity. I'm Tom Brown and join me for an Apple discovery trip. Here I'm showing my wife, Mary Kay, a great helper, some apples I found. I'm holding a Gloria Monday apple in front of me left to right a winter sweet russet, a green bellflower, a white bandiver, a big horse, black beauty, white bellflower, and deep eye. In 1905, the U.S. Department of Agriculture identified 7,000 apple varieties which were in the U.S. Actually, there are many more. Here are the few of the apples I found.
my wife and I love farmers markets. We would regularly go to the one at the fairgrounds in our area. Maurice Marshall there was selling heritage apples. I was fascinated by all the names, colors, and taste. He told me about a lost apple which had been in my area, Harper's Seedling. I started looking for it informally with no success. Uh, I approached the Clemens Journal, which was a supplement in our area, and they ran an article about my looking for old apples. And here you can see the exact date that I started all of this. I got many responses, but did not find a Harper seedling. I next approached my hometown newspaper, the Statesful Record and Landmark, and they ran about an article about my wanting to find old apples. And I finally had success. I found a yellow pots, a red pots, a mosey apple, and Watts limber twig trees. Everyone said I should go to Wilkes County, which is a nearby county, because they grew apples there commercially in the Brushy Mountains. What they did not know was Wilkes was the mother load of old apples. Long ago, newspapers were an effective way of reaching people, but now I have a better way. I ex extensively exhibit old apples at festivals. Here, my wife and I are at Wilkes County at the Brushy Mountain Apple Festival. In a typical non-COVID year, I exhibit at about 14 festivals a year. People stop by and tell me about apples they remember and people who I should see. I've exhibited at over 150 festivals. Now back to Wilkes County. Oh, wait a minute, I'm not through with that, <laughs> excuse me. There's a lot of festivals. Okay, on this county map, you'll see the one that's uh, sort of shaded in white, Yadkin County. I live in Forsyth County, uh, more or less right under the F in Forsyth County. And Wilkes County is a big county to the west of Gadkin. And there they grew uh, apples commercially in the Brushy Mountains, which is on the border, the southern border of Wilkes and the northern border of Alexander County. My greatest success in finding old apples was farther north in Wilkes County. Half of the county is only an hour drive from my home. At my most productive time, I had no or little orchard or nursery or maybe no pets or one dog, and I could go to Wilkes County about three days a week looking for old apples. Here are some of the old apples I found. That's not all. Here's some more. Oh. But not all of these ap apples that were once in Wilkes County were actually found by me there. Uh, a lot of them were mentioned in Wilkes County and described there, but found elsewhere. For instance, the, Mon the Wilkes County, uh, the Mongolian was sold by a, a nursery, the Poor's Knob Nursery there, but I found it in Grayson County, Virginia. The soda apple was in Wilkes County, but I found it in Madison County, North Carolina. And the apple with the interesting name Night Dropper was in southern Wilkes County, but I, I found that in uh, Idle County. Please join me for an apple search through Wilkes County. We will visit four orchards. I want you to notice something. All the trees in each order are orchard are different, and each orchard is different from the others, and all the varieties are rare. And looking across this bottom land, you're, 
there's a row of apple trees before you start climbing up the hill beyond. Uh, at this location, there was a, a buncombe apple tree and there was a woody apple tree, a striped delicious, a cat head queen, a red cane, a clomanger, a yellow june, and a tender skin. Now travel with me about three roads and you'll get to this site. One second, please. Here you'll notice uh, two trees. The first apple tree is called a balsam, and the second one is a pokeberry tree. And across the road is, a, is one they call it early June, but it's really a red astrakhan. Now, two more roads, and you're at this site. The tree nearest you on the right is a forward sweet, and the word forward means early. And there was also a plum apple tree there. It's a real apple, but it's called a plum. And above it is a big horse apple tree. And now travel a couple of more roads and you will be at this orchard. And the trees, apple tree in the, in the center is an American beauty. And at this site, they were also grave apples waterous apples, oat apples, and greasy apple trees. Now, there is a reason why there are so many different apples. In talking to some of the older people in the county, it was evident that their fathers and grandfathers took great pride in having apples different from their neighbors. Here are some of the reference materials I use to identify apples. For about, I guess, maybe 55% of the apples I find, the owner knows the name. And from my knowledge, it is that what they're calling the apple is reasonable. The others I have to identify. My most valuable resource is the little blue books where I've recorded my conversations with people. Very frequently, a person will remember an apple, but the tree will be gone. Another person will have an unknown apple tree, which fits the description. With thousands of contacts, uh, I'm able to put the two together. In uh, Macon County, now, this is a story about how I do put the two together. In Macon County, two men separately told me about a Manson Beauty apple they remembered. And about five or six later, years later, I found an apple on a mountaintop which fit the description. A beautiful red striped apple with red streaks in the flesh. Unfortunately, both men had passed away and could not confirm its identity. Uh, we live uh, just west of Winston-Salem on this map that shows North Carolina and Virginia. And we read in our local newspaper about a nice farmer's market in Roanoke, Virginia, a nice day trip for us. We drove up to to Roanoke using all four lane roads. For the return, I said, let's go back through the country and see if we can find an apple tree. About 20 or 25 miles south of Roanoke, I saw a home with two large apple trees in the front yard. I stopped and knocked on the door. A man appeared and said that the trees were wine sap. And I asked if there were other apple varieties in the area. He said they once had a Manson Beauty. I went back to Macon County and the approximate location is shown by the lower orange dot and got some of the apples and mailed 
down to him about 300 miles away. He said the apple was definitely a Manson beauty. About all of my apple finds are confirmed by a real person who had an earlier association with the apple. The apple identification does not have to just rely on my determination alone. When I was most actively finding old apples, I would mail the apples to the people listed here and later give them free sign wood. And I, you know, I mailed the apples at my expense. I shared my finds generously to help assure their preservations. When, the, when these people looked at the apples, they had the opportunity to say that they thought it was different than I had determined. Only once did they. I had mailed them an apple the owner called a striped June. David and Ron both said it was a summer lady finger. There were other opportunities for comment by their customers after they grew the trees and saw the apples. And finally, I went to 150 plus festivals where I had the apple on display and invited comments for people. I also gave free apple trees or sign woods to many preservation sites. Now, let me tell you a, a few apple stories. Over 20 different people had told me of the Black Beauty apple tree, but their trees were all gone, if they remembered. It was frequently mentioned in Wilkes County, and I had collected four different apples which generally fit the description of the Black Beauty, and on a nice Saturday day, I decided to drive around Wilkes County and see if anyone recognized the apples I had. My first stop was just west of Yadkin County in the edge of Wilkes County. It turned out that my notes were insufficient. The man had heard of the Black Beauty, but he had never actually seen an apple. Uh, when I was getting ready to leave, he said a foreman from a nearby farm brought me some apples and they're out there on the washing machine. Why don't you try to see what they are? They also fit the description of the Black Beauty. So on my second stop in the Western uh, Wilkes County Perlier section, I had five apple types to show them. These people certainly knew a Black Beauty because they had a dead tree across the road. Both the husband and wife looked at the washing machine apple and immediately said that it was definitely the Black Beauty. Now here's an orchard that had 17 Black Beauty trees in it. And this was in Yadkin County. And if you, here was the gate to the entrance gate to the farm. And if you look at the initials there and you're familiar with NASCAR, it would mean something. It was the wonderful farm of Jun the stock car racer, Junior Johnson. And I had the great opportunity to, to meet him and everyone had wonderful things to say about him. And another story, uh, I once called Tim Hensley who operated the uh, an apple tree selling business he called the Urban Homestead in Bristol, Virginia. And I asked him if there were any apples he was looking for. And he said, yes, a man uh, south of Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Franklin, Tennessee, had called him and was trying to find a Baca Lana. That's more or less the way he said it. And he gave me the man's phone number. Uh, and uh, anyway, the Barker's liner was actually a tree that, which originally grew on a park uh, property line, which one of the property owners was was a Barker. And, and but I thought it could be in my area because two people in northern Alexander 
County had mentioned that they remember liner apples in their area. I called the man and he gave me his description. I eventually sent him four separate boxes of apples, somewhat fitting the description, but none were the Barker liners. Sometime later, I made a phone call intended for Wilkes County, but dialed the wrong number. The man who answered, Dexter Henderson, stayed on the line when I mentioned apples. He offered to show me his apple trees and to take me to an old home site nearby with two apple trees. At the old home, one of the trees had apples which fit the Barker's liner descriptions. So I mailed them to the Franklin, Tennessee man. Both he and his brother confirmed that the apples were definitely Barker's liner. Now, these old apples are all over the place, no matter how seemingly obscure. In Yancey County, I had found an apple elder lady called a snuff apple and uh wait wait a minute there's something on my screen you, you see it about a microphone okay anyway and anyway uh but years pass with with uh with no mention uh, of the barker's liner and uh, i mean i'm sorry the snuff apple and I was, you know, beginning to think that this lady had, uh, you know, maybe it was just one tree that she had named that. But I was at the, uh, uh, that's perfect, Tom. You're doing great. Okay, wait a minute. Let's go back. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway. But I, I was at uh, one of the festivals I've gone to numerous times was uh, uh, in Richwood, West Virginia. They have a, a spring ramp festival up there. And one of my apples one year was the snuff apple. And two men separately came by from Clay County, West Virginia and recognized the snuff apple. And they, we were located 290 miles north of the original tree. And, and I can say the same thing about a Bart apple. That's one I found in northern Georgia. And it was a, a single apple uh, tip uh, limb apple. And uh, or, well, one apple grafted just on a, just as part of a single limb. And it was in an area where uh, people by the name of last name of Speed knew about the Bart apple. But then Years and years passed by, no, not a single mention of barred apples. And then in a three year period, four different people contacted me from North Central Tennessee inquiring about a barred apple they uh, remembered. And, uh, and one more was a strawberry roan. Only two people closely associated in Wilkes County knew about that when one person had a tree. And uh, and then years later, I had an apple on display and a lady came by and from Pennsylvania and said, oh, there's the old strawberry Rome apple. And uh, one other thing, comment before I close, uh, my, my search was sort of in the nick of time because there were still people who remembered the old apples and there were apple trees still living. But most of these people now have passed away, and a lot of, many of the trees have been lost. But if I'd been doing this uh, uh, 40 or 70 years earlier, it would have been astounding. There was one orchard on the uh, Wilkes Alexander County line that reportedly had 140 varieties in it. And, and then in Alexander County, there was uh, uh, a man who travel widely and pruned apple trees. And every time he found a new variety, he brought it back to his home and planted it. And he had about 125 varieties, but 
when I got there, the house was in ruins and maybe only 25 trees. And uh, I was able to, you know, identify maybe 10 of them in, in that first group of apples. The Allegheny Seedling was one of those. And I'm going to close with this. To me, it's the most beautiful apple tree in the world, a Jenny Beauty in Wilkes County. It's real unusual in its form, more or less, by two limbs. The uh, limb on the right, it goes out to the right a little bit and then turns and forms the left half of the tree. And the same on the other side, it goes out a little bit to the left and turns and forms the right half of the tree. And thank you very much for allowing me uh, to speak to you today. And I'm going to hit stop share if that's what I need to do. That's perfect. Fantastic, Tom. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I realized that um, with my enthusiasm as I was introducing you that I forgot to read your bio. But I want to give a shout out to your website, applesearch.org. Um, where I think, Tom, you shared the story that was kind of covered in your bio, but um, Tom's got some amazing resources and newsletters that he's produced um, and information. And we've uploaded one of those documents into our conference Google Drive, which I hope you all access. Um, we'll hopefully have resources from most of our speakers there that you can download, including um, how to help him search for apples um, and also um, some other information from our other speakers today. So, um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Joni. So Joni Cooper is president of Temperate Orchard Conservancy in Oregon. Uh, Joni, along with Sean Shepard and Frankie, I'm going to just butcher Frankie's name. I'm sorry, Frankie Bocellieri started uh, Temperate Orchard Conservancy in, or TOC as it's known for short, in 2011, uh, they had been chasing lost apples for years, ultimately prompted by the late Nick Botner's concern that his significant apple collection would be lost. They formed a nonprofit to preserve and to continue to search for lost and forgotten apple varieties. So with that, let's bring Joni in and um, tell us what you're doing there at Temperate Orchard, Joni. Hi. Well, it's kind of a short and a long story. It's a lot different than uh, than Tom's. He's been doing it for a long time, but we also have been searching for lost apples for, oh, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Um, we started, the three of us, started belonging to Home Orchard Society a long time ago. Uh, the point of Home Orchard Society was to teach people about growing apples, how to take care of them, how to do grafting, how to plant them in the yard, all that sort of thing. What really pushed our button was in the uh, fall of 2010, uh, the annual Home Orchard Society Fall Fruit Show. We were packed with people looking at the apples, tasting everything, getting all kinds of information and exciting about what we were doing, that sort of thing learning about growing trees in their own yard and how to take care of them. The ID apple table was lined up with people looking for, searching for answers for their unknown varieties, which is one of the things we do. One of our longtime apple friends was Nick Botner, and he was there that day. And his conversation kind of lit the fuse or pushed the button for what we started with TOC. He started his conversation with me that day by saying, Joni, you need to come down, move to Yonkala and take over my orchard. And of course we both laughed, but the reason it was prompted was because he had medical issues and he was truly concerned that his orchard, his conservation efforts would be lost. So that pushed our button. So we started, in the spring of 2011, three of us, Frankie and Sean and myself, and uh, started a small nonprofit uh, called Temperate Orchard Conservancy. And we have been finding and saving and preserving these many old apple varieties since then. Um, 
For many long years, this has been a crazy project. We've explored countless abandoned orchards and uh, history parks and that sort of thing. Um, the old homesteads have kind of been absorbed by state and federal parks and actually have accidentally preserved some of these old orchards because they haven't been demolo demolished with housing or other things. There's exploring and fun things to find, that sort of thing. When the pioneers moved to this Northwest territory, it's a lot different than Tom is talking about. Um, the gold rush in 1849 prompted so many people coming, but there were other things that people were leaving and leaving behind and hoping for better futures, all that sort of thing. Many people, when they left their home, they planted a tree in a bucket and put it in their wagon and carried it. And that tree was planted at their new homestead because it reminded them of grandma. That was heritage, that sort of thing. In 1846, Henderson Welling selected and grafted apples and pears and other trees so in 1847, he had built two wagons on wheels that were pulled by oxen, and he brought a commercial nursery by wagon to Oregon. It took him all summer. As soon as the spring was clear enough that he could travel, he and his family left, went across the plains, they were not able to stay with other wagon trains that were going because they weren't fast enough. So most of the time they ended up being by themselves. Um, they were often assisted by other people. They were also assisted by native families that saw them and helped them. It was an inspiration and it was a challenge, but they got there, they arrived in Oregon in November of 1847. And his nursery was the first to start in Oregon on the Willamette River, just down south of Portland. So it's, his was a beginning, but it was only the uh, kind of the fuse that was lit because many orchards, many nurseries started because of the gold rush, there were so many people moving to this Pacific Northwest. By the late 1800s, agricultural stations had been established in the U.S., and many apple trees had been studied in Hungary and Russia, the Balkans, by researchers in the United States, and they brought science back. Those science had been shared across the country at various agricultural stations, including one in Washington. Those science, those trees were to be studied and they were shared really quite well with the local communities, the local areas, the local people. That's one of the reasons some of them weren't lost. Five or six years ago, two guys, I think they were infected by this apple disease that we all have, uh, got caught up in the uh, excitement of hunting for those lost apple trees. They have since then found willing trompers in the area to go out looking for these old homesteads, which have been abandoned, and uh, searching for any lost orchard, any lost old apple tree. And with that, many have been found rediscovered. Uh, they do the researching on the property. They find out when the people were there, uh, when the homestead was started. So they have a really good handle on when the trees were planted, they know how old they were, and it, it goes a complete circle, so it's easier to find them. Then when they find the apples and they get permission and they send them to us, we're the ideas, and that's what we do. We've looked at hundreds of apples since we started this project. Um, our list of varieties that have been uh, identified, lost and identified, I think is 51 right now. Without some history on the property and some uh, information, it's difficult to um, 
put a date on it. Uh, so it's really important when someone's sending us an apple that we have some information instead of just an apple showing up in our hand. But it's fun and exciting, and it's what we do. Um, one of the ones that uh, is not very common, but is seen around here, is candle syrup. That's a very old apple that was sent in in the Russian collection and for some reason has been preserved in just a few orchards. But one of the ones that is probably a cousin or another name for one similar to it that we've identified is called Sari Synap. So this is fun. This is the fun stuff that we do. Um, we've identified one that was growing in Hungary. Its name is Mahalafi. Uh, Frankie posted a picture on our Facebook of Sean tasting and identifying this terrific apple. We got an immediate response from a lady who grew up in Hungary, saw the apple, remembers the apple, and remembers the taste of the apple, and of course its name. She was in tears and so was I. So it's really exciting to be part of what somebody else needs on this. There aren't a lot of us left across the country that are involved in this saving of these old varieties. We think it's really important. Um, we have about 4,000 varieties in our collection. And we keep adding to it and adding to it and trying to preserve. TOC is a very small nonprofit. We're all vol volunteer, not paid. There's no money coming in. So everything we rely upon are donations and help from outsiders. Um, this, is, this is the reason we're here. Um, we feel it's important um, to save these varieties is important because our climate is changing. We need to be able to grow a vast amount of different cultivars to be sure that they survive, to be sure that they can withstand all the climate changing that's happening right now. That's one of the things that we do. And that's our job. That's it, Leslie. Fantastic, Joni. Thank you. That was wonderful. I know I have some questions. Um, I just jotted down three or four while Joni was talking. And uh, please uh, put them in the Q&A. I know that Tim is, is uh, queuing those up for our sharing after we hear from Harry. So um, okay. feel free to put those in the Q&A and we'll get to those in just a bit. That sounds so now good. Now I'd, I'd like to introduce our final speaker. So that is Harry Burton. And Harry grew up in Northern Ontario in zone three where apples would not grow. In 1980, he discovered Salt Spring Island off the coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, which is zone eight, very different for apple growing. So Apple Luscious Organic Orchard was born. Harry's certified organic orchard grows about 210 apple varieties, including about 60 varieties of red fleshed apples on bud 118 rootstock. So using larger trees, he can require, they require no summer irrigation. He also runs the famous Salt Spring Apple Festival now in its 21st year, where they displayed 420 apple varieties in 2019. So Harry, thank you so much for being here. Let's get your presentation going on our end and uh, I understand you have a fun video of the late Nick Botner for us at the end. So we hear a lot about Nick. It'll be nice to actually see him yes. on camera. That'll be fantastic. So thank you, uh, Leslie. Thank you. And thanks to this incredible team at NAFEX for all the help in getting this thing rolling. Uh, just a slight note of interest uh, weather wise, we had no rain all summer. And just the last 24 hours, we've had. 2.5 inches of rain. We've got roads washed out. I've got no phone. Fortunately, my internet works. So anyway, we're dealing with that right now. Anyway, um, I'm delighted to be in the company of such great fruit growers like Joni and Tom and all the rest of you out there. It's just amazing. And I have to say, you are all certifiably crazy but that's what makes you so great. And that's what keeps you doing all this great stuff for no money. Um, 
Now, one of the terms that I think is very important for us, it was a term that Nelson Mandela came up with, and he, he brought out the term from South Africa called Ubuntu. And basically, Ubuntu means I am better because of you. And that's true of this fruit business even more, because all of us together connecting is such a strong team. It's amazing. So NAFEX is doing a great part of that to keep us together. So I'd like to make a toast right now. And I'd like to toast number one, Mother Nature, who is doing all the work. I do a little bit of work out in the orchard. She is working 24 hours a day. And she has created incredible varieties. Even the Canadian variety Ambrosia was a chance seedling. She created the whole thing. Secondly, I'd like to toast all the people growing great fruit of all different types. I would like to thank all the people who have grafted the best apple trees from the past so that I can go out now and get cyanwood from a Gravenstein that started in 1600. So in other words, people have kept that going and allowed us to leapfrog through time. And I'd like to toast all those people such as Joni and Tom that have taken an oath of poverty in order to keep your farm and orchard going. Okay, a little bit about Salt Spring Island. We're a small Gulf Island, about 80 square miles between Vancouver and Victoria. So we were in a protected area, protected by Vancouver Island. We're the same island chain as the San Juans in the United States. They just ran the border through the middle of us. We have about 11,000 people living here and that sort of doubles in the summer because of tourism. Our apple history started about 1860 and up until 1920, we supplied all the apples for British Columbia. And at 1920, the Okanagan took over. We have a very moderate climate. We're about zone eight, but moderate. I can hear the foghorns of the boats going by here, especially the BC ferries, if there's fog out there. Uh, we have a minimum temperature of about minus four Celsius, which is 25 Fahrenheit. Might get a few weeks of snow. We have a maximum temperature of about 25 Celsius, which is about 75 Fahrenheit. And you need a greenhouse to grow tomatoes in the summertime. Um, the cool evenings though are very valuable because that means we got a lovely dew all over our, our leaves and every surface in the morning. And to me, we have the ideal climate to grow red flesh apples because in talking to Freddie Menge from Santa Cruz, he sells red flesh apples, lots of varieties into the fancy restaurants in the Carmel Valley, but a super hot summer will wash the red color out of those. So red colors is harder in the really hot, hot climates. Um, in the early days of Salt Spring, we had fruit trees outnumbering uh, citizens by 10 to one. So that was quite amazing. And I wanna show you something here. This is an apple bowl. This is a 13 and a half inch apple bowl that came from a dead apple tree, 13 and a half inches. And that shows you the size of the apple tree that that must have came from. <clears throat> okay. Appalachia's Organic Orchard. We're certified, as Leslie mentioned. That costs about $550 a year. We're only 2.5 acres, but that's enough work for me. Uh, we have about 320 trees on the Bud 118 rootstock, which is a beautiful big rootstock, but again, doesn't need water in all those dry summers. I do also a Bud 118 interstem to make a dwarf and I use those around my garden. So the trees around my garden are not shading the garden. We grow about 210 tasty apples, 60 red flesh and uh, critter problems that we have. We have rabbits here. We didn't used to, but we have them now. So every tree, especially the young ones has to get fenced with a one inch mesh. I was using one and a half inch before 
and little rabbits and go right through that. Uh, we have deer, so we have to fence the perimeter of the property. And my chickens roam the whole orchard and the fencing I use around the trees just keeps the chickens from scratching away the mulch. They would never hurt the trees. Um, we are also lucky that we don't have any bears because bears can be a real hazard. We are lucky. So I'd like to go to the PowerPoint now. Thank you, Taylor. Okay, champions of diversity, next. I think it's very important for an orchard to state how they grow fruit. And that is my taste guarantee, which you can give to people and they can, they can see how you're doing. So just I'll just read the headings here, organic, taste, diversity, red flesh, non-irrigated, dew sweetened, nutrient dense foods and mulches. And uh, just one minor wrinkle to make sure you understand, I do irrigate new trees for about the first five years. Next. Uh, this is a variety called Pink Delight and it's one of the amazing varieties and it tends to get when it's ripe on the tree, a beautiful wax just like the king apple and they shine just like Christmas tree bulbs. Next. This is one I just got. I got it from a source over in Turkey, Bioactive or Aroma Best. It's also a great apple. Next. And again, the color variation is just amazing in this slide of apples being dehydrated. Next. Uh, this is a grenadine apple making a pie. The chefs cannot get enough of these red flags. Number one, they're very tasty. The red color is full of antioxidants. They're very healthy and they bake up red or pink. So they are just the lovely. Next. Uh, talking about my heroes, my champions of diversity. My personal hero is Albert Eder, who was farming up out of Garberville in a remote valley in the 1930s and 40s. And he created about 30 red flesh varieties. Um, unfortunately for the time, CNC Nursery took a lot of those signwoods, but they only really got one to sell for their catalog, and that was Pink Pearl. Um, fortunately, we had somebody called Ram Fishman who just passed away in the last six months or so. He went up there in the 70s and 80s, and he discovered as many as he could find. And so we do have quite a few of the Albert Eder varieties. Next. Uh, Fred Jansen was another NAFEX. He was one of the founders of NAFEX. And uh, he had a farm just out of Hamilton, Ontario. He was the first one I ever met to grow many varieties and obscure varieties. And he used geese, as you see here in his orchard, for number one, weeds, number two, for uh, protection or an alarm, because they would, they would uh, honk whenever somebody came around. And I was mentioning earlier that you NAFEX people might be interested. He was the founder and the first NAFEX uh, magazines were sent by mail to each customer. So Tom, uh, Fred would send it to the next person who would add something if they wanted. It would get sent along to the next person. That's how it would get around. So it might take in a couple months for this NAFEX magazine to circulate. Next. My old friend, Nick Botton, who just passed away in 2020, he was a dynamo and we all benefited from having Nick around. Next. Uh, the Salt Spring Apple Festival. This is a display from 2018. And what we do is the last time we set it up, we had 13 eight foot tables with all these varieties here. And we are lucky enough to get Lori Bracken from Seattle coming up to help ID apples. And we also have Ann Aylard from Sydney just across the water helping identify apples. Next. Um, one thing we do on those displays is we put in these, these stickers, the color stickers are meant to show you which person grows those apples. So you can go to our display at the Fulford Hall, see those stickers, and go to that particular orchard to get an Akane. Now, I have to admit, 
We're not quite 100% up to date yet, but we are working on getting these even more accurate. Next. And one of the most important things we have to do is get kids involved. So these kids you'll notice have a uh, face painting. We give out free face painting for Apple Festival to adults too. And so this is one thing to get those kids connected with apples. Next. Uh, at the Apple Festival, the local pie ladies, which are the Women's Institute, um, sell pies and they identify the variety that is made, that each pie is made from. So you can go and ask for a Nedwetskiana apple pie. And that way, it's a great way for you to do research. And they generally do, do about 140 pies for that particular day. And I have to admit, the longest lineup at the Fulford Hall is for pies. Next. Uh, what happens at each of the individual orchards, the venues for the Apple Festival is up to the individual venue. We probably, our most important thing is the tasting table here. And we have about four eight foot tables where we put out maybe 80 varieties for tasting. And again, a great way for people to identify what they like and then they can come over and ask for that variety and it'll either be gone or picked and ready to buy or maybe still on the tree. Next, um, this is one thing that happens at Apple Festival. We've got tasters that we don't even pay, the birds in other words. And this is a Pixie Rosso apple, a pink flesh apple that uh, only had four apples this year. This was during Apple Festival. I could only sell three of those apples. The fourth one, the birds took. Next. And the birds liked it so much, this was all that was left. A little bit of skin and the core. You can still see the little core up there. So to me, that's a real badge. If the, if the birds love it, it's a good apple. Next. Uh, one thing we do with Apple Festival also is we get some incredible posters. And this is a poster by Adrian Aikens. It's 60 of the best tasting apples on Salt Spring. We solicited all the growers on Salt Spring, got their choice. And then Adrian got the actual sample of the apple and she uh, created those at 50% of scale. And this is the beautiful poster that we have. We sell this for $20 and all the proceeds go to a local NGO that sends the money to Lesotho, South Africa. Next. Uh, a farmer on Salt Spring, Kaylee Barton, did this for the 2019 Apple Festival. Next. This is an incredible poster by Briny Penn, a local artist and author. She took the names of 340 of her apple varieties from the 2018 Apple Festival, and she made a layered map of Salt Spring. That's what Salt Spring looks like. It looks like three chunks put together and a beautiful, beautiful art piece. And she also, with the, the, the border around the edges, Salt Spring anecdotes, and the little apple in the bottom right is another Salt Spring anecdote. Lovely. Next. And this is the anecdote in that bottom apple. The lovely blue paramain was so valuable that Corey Manhannock in the 1920s would not sell that to his neighbors next door. Next. Uh, our, uh, we get an annual poster from Diana Morris, a Newfoundland person that's now living here. And she does a beautiful, beautiful poster every year for us. And I want to point out in this poster that if you start at the upper right, you're starting in May. And as you work down and you're going June, July, August, and September, is the bottom left where the apples are. Next. Um, one of the other things we do, this is another apple pie celebration. This is done at the Moss Street Market in Victoria where I sell apples. So about two weeks after the fall fair, we get roughly 25 chefs that I give or someone else gives them a known apple variety and they bake two pies and the pie variety has to be labeled. So people can then 
take their plate, which they pay $5 for, and they can get three small pieces from three different pies that equal one piece of pie, and they pay five bucks for that. And again, with this, all the money goes to a local charity. Next. And I think this is the final slide. This is incredible Nick Botner. And he put a little seed on his business card. My business card grows an apple tree when planted. What does yours do with his phone number? Next, I think that's the end. That's the end. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about champions of diversity. First of all, mother nature, I was mentioning earlier, she created so many apple varieties that had no help from anybody. Uh, the Gravensteins, King Bramley's, Ambrosia, and we even have an incredible Cox cross that happened in a compost pile in Victoria that's called Poppy's Wonder. And it's a fabulous apple too. Mother Nature did the whole thing. <clears throat> My second is second champion of diversity is Albert Etter. He was called a hillbilly pomologist. And the only one that, the only variety that he actually got recognized at the time was Pink Pearl. Um, he had a favorite saying, my farm is just like set heaven, except you have to work. And an interesting anecdote now, I have a 99 year old friend on South Spring who's still the most vital and incredible brain that you ever met. She met Albert Edder in, 19, uh, in 1937 when she was four, 14 years old. Her and a girlfriend, we're up fishing with the father and they walked up this little road and somebody called him into the orchard to show his tree. And she saw the Albert Edder tree, which had 50 varieties growing on it. That was one of his uh, specialties. Okay, Albert Edder used a surprise apple for breeding. And what I've got right here is an amazing book. This is the Downey book from 1856. And this was in the... Uh, attic of an 1872 uh, farm on Salt Spring Island, the Ruckel Farm. And I was given this by the great, the, the granddaughter of the creator of that farm in 1870. This is the Downey book that lists all apple varieties from that year. And it does talk about the surprise apple in here, but it doesn't say very good things about it of little or no value, but are admired by some for its singularity, its red flesh. Well, Albert Edder was enough of an independent thinker that he said, I can grow that better in Edersburg. And he did, and he used that as the main breeding source for his apples. Now, he also used very amazing different crosses, like lots of crabs, but yet he gained incredible results from that. And as I say, we have quite a few varieties out now because people went and looked for them in the 70s and found red flesh. And then uh, they tended to, uh, uh, especially Ram Fishman tended to get those going and Ram was even selling them. Um, so that was Albert Etter. The third one I mentioned was Fred Jansen, founder of Nafex and uh, he had an amazing orchard and he died about probably 20 years ago now. And unfortunately his orchard just got bulldozed, which is what we wanna prevent from happening. But anyway, those things happen. Okay, the fourth one and the last one I'm gonna mention is Nick Botner, who I was lucky to meet. I had his list of sign wood. I never met the guy. I drove up his driveway probably 15 years ago and end up staying for three days and helping him out. So that was just how Nick and Carla operated. Uh, he was in the Battle of the Bulge. He also was a homesteader in Alaska, and he had the largest private collection of apples in North America. Uh, he was a very important person to a large number of apple growers, including myself. He was a catalyst selling his signwood. And anytime I got a sign wood package from him, there would always be a few extra red flesh varieties in there, including things like Darlene Chaplin and Norman Cross. Those are not a known variety. That's just the name of the person who owned the tree that he got it from. So we're just trying to figure out if those varieties are actually have got another name. 
Um, Nick is the reason I created the Appleholics Anonymous Constitution because he was my poster child, Nick Butner. And Nick, Ram Fishman was very, very uh, conservative with his science. He didn't give them out at all. And when Nick asked him for some, he said no to Nick. Nick said to him, I'll get them. So here's a little video I took of Nick at the Home Orchard Society uh, sale. And uh, this is the sale that Joni used to run. Where did that machine have? No, I'm not. I got to document you. Huh? How many did you collect this morning? How much? What? How many did you collect this morning? Not much. Just from there here. Oh, I saw you going down the other side. Oh, I got that side. And here I thought I got a lot. No, this guy is the Appleholics Anonymous poster child. He is. Anonymous, yeah. <laughs> how many trees do you have, Nick? How many trees? Yeah, how many trees do you got? Probably 6,000 trees, but... <laughs> Gosh, if I had the property for 6,000 trees... <laughs> well, he'll sell it to you. <laughs> yeah, to sell. I'll sell it. It's cheap. <laughs> Good, thank you. So hair, preserving heritage apple trees, do we have a problem? Yes, we have a big problem. Uh, many of the old fabulous English heritage orchards are being bulldozed and people in England are buying galas grown in France. And I tell my customers when they ask for it, they say they like galas. I say everything I grow is better than a gala. So over there, they had things like Gascoigne, Scarlet, Merton Wooster, Laxton's Epicure. Okay, one of the big culprits here, I would say the biggest is supermarkets and big box stores. Not only do they only sell about 12 varieties that have a pin number, but good taste is not even a criterion. My customers tell me that they can no longer eat store-bought apples after eating mine. So in one sense, these commercial growers are shooting themselves in the foot. What does a big box store want? They want huge quantities of high quality apples. They want a delivery date specified. They want to pay you half the price and they want pretty apples. So red is unfortunately the color that everybody wants and ugly apples such as the Cox orange, very difficult to sell. Um, they also want uniform size. Um, they, they also have no interest in one person who grows, let's say, one tree of Merton Beauty, and they have no interest in such a thing as a Gravenstein, which is considered to be the best apple on salt spring. So, one interesting thing, too, is that customers will come to me and buy an apple off my tree that's got a mark on it, but they would never buy that from a store. Okay, solutions, what do we do? Number one, I sell at a farmer's market in Victoria, which is a half hour ferry ride and a half hour drive. And that is amazing. First of all, it's a change of pace. It's a great, uh, a great market. Customers are so enthusiastic. It's like fuel to keep you going. Um, and uh, in normal times, I would put a little white bowl in each box and give samples so they can actually do some grazing and find out exactly what they want and they end up going home with apples they love. And one of my greatest rewards is having customers re request a specific apple. Number two solution is the Salt Spring Apple Festival. Uh, we finally got that back on track in 2011, uh, 2021 uh, but we didn't have any indoors display. So we didn't do the Apple display this year. We'll do that hopefully next year. This year we had about a thousand people touring the orchards and just loving it. In 2019, we had about 1800 when everything was wide open. Um, as I showed you earlier, we want to connect participants with the exact tree in the exact orchard that grows the apple that they want. Um, I have seen an older woman on a walker bound up two stairs when I indicate I had the Gravenstein apples that she grew up with and she wanted to get them. 
And we always make a point of trying to get the kids involved. Okay, solution number three. At the Salt Spring Fall Fair, which is always two weeks before the Apple Festival, if you're familiar with fairs, they want five identical apples of a known variety that conform to the description of that variety. Frustrating, I don't put anything into those categories. We created two new categories. We created the sweetest apple category, which people submit to, and we have a refractometer here, which I use to measure percent sugar. And we hand out a ribbon, a first place ribbon to the apple with the highest sugar. And the one I really love is the people's choice. Uh, anybody on Salt Spring can submit maybe eight of their favorite apples into the fair. And then we get, we just hand out slips of paper on Sunday morning to people walking by and say, taste all these and give us your first, second and third. And we collate those and that becomes our, uh, our the winning prize. Um, Harry, I know, um, I know you've got one more video that you wanted to share. It's only about a minute, but I want to make sure that we leave some time for the Q&A. Okay, on the back I'll, end. Just say, I'll just say one more thing and we'll forget about that video. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, the fifth solution is growing red flesh apples, which just amaze people when they bite into them. The chefs can't get enough of them. And there's two styles of red flesh, I believe. The Edder style, which has leaves that are green, and wood that is white. And they're, to me, they are sort of the sweeter apples. And then we have the Hansen type, which I call it, which has red wood and red tips on the leaves. And they tend to be a little bit tartar. And some of them are a little bit earlier. And Albert Edder said, my apples will be served in the finest restaurants in San Francisco. Now, he wasn't quite right at that time, but he sure is right now. He was my hero. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. So I have seen the, the Q&A just popping and I am super excited to shift over there. So if our host Taylor would bring uh, Tim online, um, that would be great. And switch us into gallery view, we will, um, and Joni as well, fantastic. Um, and I can help by unmuting. There we go. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I'd like to ask one question before we go to the questions that you've got for us, Tim. Um, and that is um, about how, if, if people are interested in perpetuating the, um, these various cultivars and um, <laughs> seedlings that you have, what are some of the sources where they can go to get that? I know, for example, Joni, that folks can order through your website. You have a list that you post there. In fact, I've put that into the Google Documents section for the conference, um, that list as of 2019 or 2020. I can't remember what's currently on the website mm -hmm. and your Apple order form. But what are some of the other sources out there that someone could go to that are either growing trees or have scion wood available for grafting if they want to join um, this um, small and passionate group of heirloom apple growers. Maybe get Tom um, to start that one. Sure. Okay. I sell apple trees, <laughs> Tom Brown. <laughs> Great. So applesearch.org, um, you've got trees for sale, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I have trees for sale, but they are only available in Canada because of that border. Signwood may be different. I used to get signwood sent up by Nick every year. Um, I think one thing that has to happen, we just lost Home Orchard Society. And what we need is a website of signwood sources. I've got some great sources, one in England, one in Turkey. We need to have those things available to everybody. We don't want to hide those. Those have to be out there. So maybe NAFEX would be interested in doing a website listing all the incredible places that we can get those trees. That sounds like a wonderful idea. Um, so I know of um, Century Farm Orchards in uh, North Carolina as well. I know, uh, in fact, a few, Tom, that you had listed in your PowerPoint presentation. Big Horse Creek is now just doing cyanwood. But I think interestingly that um, 
the uh, Horn Creek um, Historical Farm in North Carolina also has Lee Calhoun's collection there. So there are sources out there for heirloom uh, apples and cyan wood. And um, I'm very glad to know that all of our panelists today are um, making that cyan wood and, and apple trees available as well. That's yep. fantastic. One, one important thing to remember, and I tell everybody, if you want to preserve apple, apple varieties, buy the apples. That's one way to preserve those. Mm -hmm. You know? That's a good point. All right, Tim, what do we have in terms of uh, questions? <clears throat> the first question, uh, great uh, point, Harry, about one of our founders, uh, Mr. Fred Jansen. Our other founder, as our uh, website reminds us, was Milo Gibson out of uh, Oregon, where I'm also from, as well as Joni. And so the, one of the questions is from Dan Lefever, uh says, Harry, about 20 years ago, you had posed a question in Pomona as why you didn't have cedar apple rust even you have even though you had these cedars in the surrounding area i intended to answer it but life got in the way it is because of juniper apple rust from the misnomer eastern red cedar juniperus virginia not cedrus species so first question is about um, your trees and they're resistant to cedar apple rust i can't say i've got cedar big cedars all around me i don't do anything specific i do make sure that every tree i plant though gets about a half a teaspoon of mycorrhiza put on the roots and fungi.com in uh, in uh, Olympia is where I get that amazing stuff. That's great. And I, I should take the opportunity to give a shout out to our closing keynote by Michael Phillips, who's written Mycorrhizal Planet. And yeah. that'll be a topic that we'll talk be talking about in terms of um, yeah. strengthening your apples with uh, strengthening, making sure you have uh, good fungal and yep. microbial activity in your soil. Um, and that's on Saturday night. Great. Uh, I, I have a comment about cedar apple rust. If you'll spray the trees with Dow Agro Rally 40 WSP, it's a fungicide that will take care of cedar apple rust. All right, thank you, Tom. Tim? We have a lot of specific questions about red flesh, but a more generic question from our board member, Chris Homanix, is what are the best low chill hour apples that you would recommend? And that question was for Tom or anyone. Uh, well, people contact me from uh, uh, real hot areas, and I always refer them to a publication if, if they will Google deciduous fruit and nuts for the low desert. It's a University of Arizona publication. And it lists uh, low chill fruit trees that they recommend, but it's it's for you know any warm place, not just the desert, just not just the Phoenix area. That's great. And I know that um, we've got uh, on our board, Larry Stevenson from Southern Cultured Orchard and Nursery in Mississippi um, for apple trees that will grow in the hot, humid South. Uh, I also know of Cuffle Creek in Southern California um, that also does some low chill varieties as well. So they're worth um, checking out uh, online as well. What's next? So Janet, Asks, how do you tell the difference between a lost apple and a known apple with an alias? As an example, I have a summer orange bench graft with Lee Calhoun's book saying it is a synonym for fall orange from Massachusetts, but the nomenclature book has about a dozen alternative names. Well, I have uh, right now Hidden Rose is one of my best red fleshes, and it's going by three names right now. So I had to go every one of them just to make sure they were the same. and. Even if they are the same, I will still keep each of those. So lots of synonyms, especially in the red flesh business. And Joni, I'd like to ask you, um, there are some efforts now um, happening uh, for genetic testing and identification. Can you describe some of the um, activities there that might solve some of these questions about multiple names for the same apple? <laughs> well, it's going to be a long activity, but yes, there's a group that uh, is working together in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and uh, they're trying to do the DNA 
uh, trying to be consistent, trying to come up with a panel so that uh, the names are consistent and we can identify them. That's one of the things that we're doing at TOC is trying to do an identification and also to do ultimately do the DNA because there are so many names out there. If somebody gets acquires uh, a piece of property and it has some old trees on, they don't know what it is, they give it a name. And that's, that's the way it is all through history. Yep. So I think... Uh, people who are trying to do the ID work, it's really difficult. It's very hard. Uh, and so it has to be, you have to have history, you have to have books, you have to have uh, research. And then ultimately, the bottom line, of course, is ultimately the DNA testing. Right. And uh, Joni, you're involved in an effort uh, called the Fruit Registry. And yes. Registry, the way that it's spelled. Normally, it's R-E-G-I-S-T-R-E-E, -E -E, correct? I think so. <laughs> Somebody's coming up with all these names, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that idea is to be able to put that information online and, and put together an online database. So there, there are efforts being made across the country to, to create um, shareable databases of this information. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. It's starting out small, but it's it's growing because we are in we want to invite people who have a collection who have doesn't even have to be a big orchard so that they can submit their information, what their tree is, age, all that resource and everything. So it goes on that database. So we have a collection clear across the country. They're doing the same thing in Europe. Uh, and so uh, this is kind of small starting out, but it's going to be a big project. And we want everybody to participate. Everybody who has their apple collection or their cherry collection or their pear collection. It's not just apples. It's all the fruit because it's so important that we don't lose it. Excellent. That's wonderful. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out that one of the great resources was some of the documented descriptions of apples and that was only recently published a few years ago is Dan Bussey's book, which is the um, illustrated history of apples in the United States and Canada. And it is a seven volume masterwork <laughs> that is now amazingly for sale for at this moment, um, $150 for that entire set. And um, yeah. that is definitely a get them while they last, because if you're a member of alcoholics, or excuse me, of uh, alcoholics anonymous, <laughs> Um, it's a terrific resource. We it is use amazing. it all the time, all yeah. the time. Yeah. It's fantastic. And yeah. Dan is working, <laughs> he's working on expanding it. I think he's just like, yeah, he's just like us. He's crazy. Yes, yeah. yes. But it's a wonderful source. And Dan's on our panel on Friday night, which is great. Wow. Tim, you want to yeah. give us another question? Yeah, so lots of red flesh uh, apple questions, but please comment right now if we have a few more openings. Question for Harry from Janet. When did, uh, who did, when did you first grow red flesh apples and which were the first one? Do you have a list of all of the red flesh apples? The California Nursery Company introduced the pink pearl in 1944 and sold them until 1970. When did red flesh apples become popular? And who besides Ram Fishman introduced them from Janet? Um, wow, wow. Yes, I have a list of everyone I've got hovering in around 60 and uh, just being tested because I have what's called the five year itch, meaning that I've got some trees that have not produced yet. That Pixie Rosso I showed you, I ate it this year for the first time. So it takes five years before you figure out is it the right name? And then when you get it and it is the right name, is it any good? Um, yeah. Um, that, did I miss a part there? That was a multiple layered question. <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, while I'm thinking about it, uh, I wanna give a shout out too to Derek Mills who is our yeah. Apple interest group chair. And he also has an amazing collection uh, yes. in the Midwest and sells apples there. So um, Probably the biggest collection in North America, I think, right now. Yeah, and pretty significant uh, collection of the red flesh apples. Yep. As well. And selling cyanide. Yeah, that's right. Tim? 
Uh, well, Janet kind of has a similar question. Do you know Niels Hansen, red flushed apples, uh, parentheses, Almata, et cetera, and all, uh, as well as Etters? Do you cross them? And if so, do the apples take after Etters or Hansen's from Janet? I don't do any crosses. I can't answer that. And knowing the diversity of crossing apples, the answer could be yes and no, because you'll get everything. The odds are apparently one in 80,000 that what you get will be as good as what you started with, though. So it's a long shot. Tim, let's take another. Uh, Janet has a comment that California Nursery Archives just scanned the movie of Albert Etta in his orchard. It shows that one of his multi corrupted trees. Maybe we can share that link. Uh, David Fulton says three great presentations Tom Joan Harry's infectious enthusiasm and passions for heirloom apples. Thanks to all three of you. So we have some nice comments. Um, Joe has a question for Harry. Were those apple chips in the pie shell shown earlier dehydrated? Do they make the pies with dehydrated chips? No, no, those were actually fresh grenadines. Great. I have a, a question here and or a, a comment too. Every so often, especially in our, our uh, North American Fruit Explorers Facebook uh, uh, Facebook group, which is a wonderful place to ask questions. We see the story about Tom um, circling around at, you know, with a display of apples in front of him and everybody, you know, gets all excited and, um, and, and wants to talk with Tom, but there's only one Tom. And uh, so I think um, in terms of reaching out and, um, because you probably all have this happen where folks want you to help identify an apple for them, but I'm sure you don't all have the time to do that. So I want to put in a plug for um, our Facebook group and other forums as well online. There are other fruit, you know, and apple growing groups are great places to throw that out there and ask a question because goodness knows, I suspect y'all don't have the time uh, to uh, identify individual apples. Uh, although I know you want help in that continued quest to discover them. Is that correct, Tom? Well, I usually get up at 4.30 every morning to answer emails, so oh my I, God. <laughs> I try my best to answer every one, and in the last uh, two years, I've gotten approximately 4,000 new inquiries, and you know, a lot of these are multiple emails, and I've answered them all except there was one period they were coming in like a hundred a day, so I had to maybe oh, for three hundred I had to put them on a, an out of office answer. But other than that, I you know try to give them a respectful answer and help them. Well, that's terrific. We need to uh, to start wrapping up. Um, if let me ask the panelists: Is there anything that uh, that we haven't covered uh, that you would like to say before we close out? I would like to say one thing that I didn't say earlier. I would love to see someone do a website called Champions of Diversity. And there's no criterion to get into it, but we want everybody that's doing something like Tom and Lee Calhoun, who I never met, and all these other people to be in that website, just to give them a, a heads up. What a great idea. Thank you for that. And I'll right. add it, it's been an honor to participate with you wonderful people in so, such a great amount of knowledge and enthusiasm. It's been a great honor. Well, thank you, Tom. And thank you all. Uh, on behalf of the North American Fruit Explorers, Explorers I'd like to thank Tom, Joni, and Harry for making this a great session. Uh, once again, the recording of the session will be made available on our nafex.org webpage uh, in 24 hours and posted in about a year, made public on our uh, YouTube channel, FX TV. Um, folks can, uh, it's not too late for folks. If you uh, tell a friend, they can certainly sign up and watch these for the next year on our site. So what a treasure it's gonna be to have 12 video sessions um, from this conference as a resource, even if folks couldn't make it in real time. So there uh, will be other downloadable content, as I said, on our webpage um, for the conference in our Google Drive. 
and uh, don't miss the other sessions that we have coming for the rest of the week through Saturday night, two sessions a day as part of our 2021 virtual conference, Fruit Forward going, Growing for Tomorrow. And please stay connected on social media. I mentioned our Facebook group. Uh, we're also on Instagram and Twitter, and we have a Facebook page you can follow as well. So you'll find all those links on our homepage. Again, thank you, thank you Leslie. Oh, thank you, Joni. Um, it's been absolutely a delight to be in conversation with you all. And I love what you're doing. Um, I'm, we're growing heirloom apples here in North Georgia as well. And it's because of all of your amazing work. So thank you to everybody for uh, attending and um, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. And a great team you got there. Thank you. Yeah, good job. Thanks. Great job, board. Good night. Thank you. Okay.